So first, to welcome all of you, both those who are attending summer school and those who are not. Summer school is one of UCT's curious institutions. It grew out of the Army Education Service at the end of World War II, when ex-servicemen coming back to Cape Town started adult education activities, out of which summer school grew. And of course it's evolved and evolving and will evolve in the future. So it's a great pleasure to welcome those of you who are here at summer school and those of you who are simply here because you're interested and concerned alumni. Enough of that. The second thing I want to do is to talk briefly about the Legacy Society. It occurred to me as I came into this building this evening, this is the Wilfred and Jules Cromer School of Law. How did that come about? That came about because Wilfred Cromer said to his attorney, I've got a lot of money and I don't know what to do with it when I die. And his attorney said, well, would you like to consider your alma mater? And he said, no. That was a place in the north. <laughs> so his attorney said, well, what about the University of Cape Town? Well, the consequence of that is that for very many years in now, and for, we hope, the future, the Kramer Law Grants support research and students in the law faculty, and the Jules and Wilfred Law uh, Kramer Grants support many students in our College of Music every year. That's simply because somebody had the forethought to say, right, I've got means, but those means have no purpose after I die, and made provision in his will for that to come to the University of Cape Town for the support of the law faculty and for the support of music and the South African College of Music, which is UCT's faculty of, uh, department of music. So the Legacy Society, which UCT instituted under Stuart Saunders's leadership, exists to encourage people to make provision in their wills for something that they would like to see perpetuated at UCT. And so my brief message is think about UCT in your will. Even if it is the residual beneficiary after everybody else has died. In other words, all the people you'd like to take care of, they may not survive you. What happens? What would you like to do with your estate after that? Either way, if you think that a percentage of your estate or a particular amount or a final residual beneficiary might be a particular project or the undesignated endowment of UCT, think about it. The undesignated endowment is really important to the university because it's that which is permanent, which generates an annual income, and I have to say the investment of UCT's endowment has been such that I wish my funds had been in it. It's been extremely well managed for the last 30 years. Uh, the undesignated endowment gives annual income from that permanent endowment which allows the council to make allocations to those things which can't otherwise be funded. So, enough of that little sermon. My next and most important purpose this, this evening is to introduce Professor Loretta Ferris to you. She's one of UCT's three Deputy Vice-Chancellors and she has, amongst other things, the awesome responsibility for leading and guiding transformation in the institution. She came to UCT 10 years ago, I think 2009, nearly 10, so this will be the 10th year. So she's relatively new uh, to UCT. Um, and she was educated at the other place. We won't name it, but uh, <laughs> nonetheless, but she finally found the right place to be. Um, her interests have been in environmental law and in how to rethink environmental law and environmental education. But now that she occupies a leadership place at UCT, she's going to talk to us about finding a place at UCT. Loretta, over to you. 
Well, first of all, good afternoon and um, thank you for coming on a Saturday afternoon, no less, um, to come and hear me talk about something that lies very close to my heart, um, and that is transformation. Thank you, you also, for that um, introduction and, and to the um, development office for asking me to do this lecture this afternoon. Now, I've titled this Finding a Sense of Place at UCT, and hopefully the reason for, for the title will become apparent as I, I take you through um, this journey this afternoon. But I want to preface it by actually um, beginning by talking about my own personality, my own, not my own personality, my own perhaps attitude is, is a better word, as an alum. Um, as you as indicated, I'm, I'm not an alum from UCT. But I recently spoke to an alum from UCT. And he's roughly my age, which means that we, normal, we more or less went to universities, our respective universities, at the same time. And somehow the conversation was around UCT and him as an alum of UCT. And he spoke with such passion about this place. Not only as, you know, the, the, the sort of at a distance now looking at UCT, but also about the time that he was a student here at UCT. And he told me that he lived in Smuts Hall. So for him, he felt that he was part of UCT the whole time that he was here because he, he practically lived. He's not from Cape Town. He's from up north. And so, of course, he spent the, the four years that he did his degree here, he spent very much living at UCT and becoming a part of it on upper, camp, upper campus. His classes were there, he lived there, um, he was part of the, of the leadership structures of the university and the governance structure. So he felt like he was also, you know, leaving a, a kind of a stamp at UCT. And so, as a result, he feels very passionate about UCT. And it was, and when it was a really ref refreshing conversation and, and I walked away feeling sort of, you know, wow. But of course, then I went home and I, I reflected on my own lack of passion for my alma mater. And I thought, well, why is that? Um, why do, unlike this person that I talked to, or perhaps my siblings who went to a historically black university very close to us as well, um, who, who are very good alumni of the institution, why do I feel that sort of a dissonance with my alma mater? And I don't want to talk about my alma mater, but, but I want to perhaps maybe express the experience that many students had at their universities at the time. And so we're talking about the late 80s, early 90s. So my particular, perhaps my particular experience was clouded by the fact that I wasn't, and at the time, the, the students were referred to as Martis, so that would give you a clue. But I wasn't referred to as a Marty. I was referred to as a brain Marty, a brown Marty. Um, well, me and other people that, that looked like me. Um, perhaps it was because legally I was not allowed to live on campus or anywhere near campus. Perhaps it had to do with the fact that as I walked across the campus, almost all of the buildings then had names such as Verwurt or Foster, honoring the very architects of a system that forced me to walk almost an hour to get to campus every day. Perhaps it has to do with the fact that not a single lecturer inspired me in, and inspired me any real belief that I could one day be an academic. There was also not, of course, a single black academic at my faculty at the time who could be a role model and who could influence me. In fact, many years later, I had the dubious honor of being the first black academic at that law faculty. Perhaps it was because my experience was of being othered, of being tolerated, of being endured at the university. So as a result, I think I'm not a passionate alum. I'm not a particularly loyal alum, and I'm not a particularly good alum who gives time or money. And when I reflected about that, it made me feel quite sad. It made me feel sad that I didn't have the passion that this alum, the UCT alum had. And I felt like I'm, 
I'm missing out on something. I should have had that. I should have wanted to give something back to my university. And so I think it's because I never felt like I belonged. I now continue to feel that lack of belonging to my alma mater. So why sense of place? So this concept is one that grabbed me a few years ago. I was doing some research around fracking in the Karua. And I was reading some of the public consultation process, some of the comments from the public consultation process that was happening at the time. And there was one comment in particular that struck me. I was reading through the transcript. And, and one woman said, um, if you touch the Karua, you touch my mother. I was like, wow, you know, what is, what is this all about? Because, of course, from an from a environmental point of view, the, the whole idea of, of hydraulic fracturing is, an, is a, it's a technology that has quite an, an adverse impact on the environment. And that we all know, we've seen it in the US, we've seen it in Australia, France, all around the world. And so as an environmental lawyer, you know, I was, I was interested purely from that perspective. What are the impacts on water in particular? And so that's how I started my research. But when I saw this, I was thinking, well, what is so special about the Karua? And it made me, me read a little bit about this very particular part of, uh, you know, the, the impact that, that hydraulic fracturing may have. And, it, and, and what I came across then is this concept of sense of place. And I will talk to you a little bit more about it, but let me just begin by defining place, because, because that was for me a, a good starting point at the time. And when you look at a dictionary, it'll give you quite a number of definitions. It will tell you that a place is a particular position or a point or an area or a location. It will tell you that it's a portion of space designated for being used. But then there's a definition that strikes me. It says that a place can be seen as a space that has meaning. So this is the definition that is worth pondering. The idea that a place is a space with meaning. And then of course, well, it made me think, well, let me go and see what is a space then, right? So I'll turn to the Oxford Dictionary once again. And these are some of the de definitions that, that got my attention. Space is defined as a continuous area or expanse which is free, available, or unoccupied. The physical universe beyond the Earth's atmosphere. The near vacuum extending between the planets and the stars. An interval of time. The portion of a text or document available or needed to write about a subject. Or capacity of storage for data in a computer or other digital device. All of the above definitions suggest that space is a state of emptiness. Of course, if you're an astrophysicist, you won't agree with that. But it is described as a vacuum, like nothing, an interval, waiting for something to happen, something to be filled, because for night, right now, it is filled with nothing. And place, it is suggested, is what gives meaning to space. What was interesting about the Karua, though, um, and this is just an aside, is that it was exactly the space part of the Karua that gave its meaning. It was exactly the nothing, the nux that is in the Karua that for many people makes it special. Right? And then, so, so in a way, the specialness of, of, of the meaning can also be derived from the nothing. But I looked at this, and, and this became then um, part of my, my inaugural address um, quite a few years back now, um, but looking at this notion of sense of place. So let me quickly then just describe to you what, what sense of place is all about. It is about identity and relationships. It's about the identity of a place. Once again, think about the Karua. It has a very specific identity. But of course, I mean, we, we want the Karua becomes a very handy kind of example. But, you know, when um, I lived in Johannesburg for, for some part of my life, there were people that felt very attached to Johannesburg, to the skyscrapers, to, oh, think about New York, 
you know. So every, every place has its own identity that creates in people um, the sense of place. So it's the identity, but it's also the relationships then that people have with that very particular identity. And this, of course, it ex is expressed in both tangible and, and intangible ways. And it's, of course, the intangible, really, that we're trying to, to, to look at here. So, so the sense of place has, has three facets that I want to lift out here. Um, the strongest is that of place identity, which I just described, this notion of, of identifying with, with a place. And psychologists have defined place identity as the experience of a person in a particular setting that is defined or tied to the way that the person sees him or herself as manifested through symbolic meanings related to culture and heritage. So in other words, it's not just about the place, but the place actually begins to, for you, begins to be, be something about you, right? You beginning to see yourself, your own identity very much expressed at that place. A second facet is that of place attachment, which has been described as the symbolic relationship formed by people giving culturally shared or emotional affective meanings to a particular space or piece of land that provides the basis for the individuals and groups understanding um, of and relation to the environment. So place attach attachment is more than in the emotional and cognitive experience that you have when you're looking at place identity. It also includes cultural beliefs and practices that links people to place. So for, for instance, uh, recently as we were uh, meeting with the, with the Koi leadership group, and, and I'll come to so the Sara Bartman renaming of uh, Memorial Hall. But as we were, were meeting, and we had a series of meetings with, um, with the Khoi descendants and, and Khoi community and leadership structures, um, the, the, the whole notion of the cultural attachment to Table Mountain, Hurikwaha, came out very strongly, right? And that's something that, that hundreds of years later still lives within people. And, and I found that to be very interesting. And the third facet of, of sense of place is that of place dependence. And so that speaks to the degree to which occupants perceive themselves to be strongly associated with a place because they're dependent on a place. So, right? so it may be because you know, your livelihood depends on a place and that's why you, you may um, develop a sense of place. Um, for that particular place. So, so perhaps if we begin to think about universities and their sense of place, perhaps that this is the place where you develop um, knowledge, where you produce knowledge that, that actually invokes in you that sense of place. So <clears throat> with respect to these three elements, various studies have shown that place and inhabitants are intertwined and that the spatial environment partially, partially supports the emotional security and psychological wellness of its <coughs> inhabitants. So there's a guy called um, Albrecht. He's an Australian psychologist, and he's done some research that shows that, and he, came, he coined this concept solastalgia. And he, and he says that when people's physical environment changes around them, that they develop a sort of a nostalgia, um, but, but it's a nostalgia because they, that is different because they're still there. So he, was, he's, he works on, on mining communities in Australia, and, and he tracks the kind of emotional changes in communities where um, there may be rapid expansion as a result of, of mining. And that's through this research that he coined this notion of, of solastalgia. So there's a, there's a nostalgia, except you haven't left. You're still there. Your physical environment has changed, and that creates in you um, a deep sense of pain. And, um, and so that's, that's, you know, this is this, this connection between psychological wellness and the spatial environment. So in this way, the, the spatial environment contributes to evoke a specific human experience and has the potential to, to add to the quality of life or take away from your quality of life um, and supporting individuals to achieve and sustain fulfilled lives. Now, obviously, you, you realize I'm coming to a point where I'm making the argument that it may be 
that some of our students, some of our staff, don't feel as connected, um, that they do not have that sense of, of connectedness to this university. Um, and as I was, I was writing this, I, I was beginning to think about all of the problems that we have in terms of student wellness, mental wellness over the last, well, certainly the last two years that I've been part of this, of, of the executive in this university, it became very apparent to me that, that students are struggling, that many, many members of our staff are struggling. Um, and it made me wonder, you know, because we, especially when you speak to young black students, if you speak to young black students from historically disadvantaged um, backgrounds um, that comes to UCT, that feels a deep sense of disconnection and displacement from this university. Um, and when you have those conversations, you know, I am struck by um, the anxiety, the depression that, that these students have. Um, and, and they often speak about not feeling connected to the university. And that, that is something that I feel that we need to change. And that, so when we talk about transformation, it is also about this thing. Now, um, of course, universities are places, as I'm, as, you know, as I'm, as I'm trying to, to argue. And of course, modern universities have historically and traditionally been defined by their relationship to geographical places. So, so they're often named after, they identify with a town, a city, a province, you know, so University of KwaZulu Natal, Rhodes University, University of Cape Town, etc. They've also become important architectural patrons. So the land on which they stand and the buildings they have created tells us a great deal about each university, and UCT is no different. And through architecture and naming of buildings have formed a very particular cultural identity that shapes the university and creates for students and staff and for alum and for the broader public a particular place that carries a particular meaning. I certainly spend the bulk of my day, the bulk of my week, as you can see, even a Saturday at UCT, and so does many other members of staff and, and of course, students. So, so this is the place where we, where we, we spend our time. Um, and so I think at UCT, it is, it is arguably quite possible that we experience all three facets of sense of place, that we identify or don't with UCT, um, that we are dependent on UCT in the sense that it is our, our livelihood or the place where we, um, that will in future be our, our the, or the, that which allows us to have a, a livelihood. Um, and ultimately, I, I think it's the place that we are attached to or not. But now, some scholars also emphasizes the social construction of sense of place. So Greider and Gargovich um, are two um, scholars that makes the point that any physical place has the potential to embody multiple landscapes, each of which is grounded in the cultural definitions of those who encounter that place. So they say every river, and they, of course they, they, they talk about it in the context of, of, a, of a physical landscape, but I think that's, um, that's the same for, for something like a university. But they, they capture it by saying every river is more than one river. Every rock is more than just one rock. In essence, they suggest a landscape is not just about those biophysical properties, but it is in essence about us. So I, I think that that it, sense of place is in fact also a social construct. Uh, and that it, it does not necessarily invoke a shared experience or an experience in which everybody is, is equally situated. So, so going back to the work of, that I've done about the Karua, um, I, I made the argument that it could be, and, and since I haven't done the, the, you know, the kind of um, qualitative, uh, uh, sorry, quantitative um, research about it, I, but I was making the argument that it is possible that Whilst, if, if you're situated in a particular way, so let's say, for example, you are a middle-income landowner who lives on a farm, that you may experience that nothingness of the Karua in a very particular manner. But if you are somebody that lives in a Karua town like Beaufort West, where there is no prospect of a job, um, 
and you live in, in one of the so-called colored townships of, of Beaufort West, that your sense of place of the Karua may be a very different one. Um, and that you may actually welcome um, the possibility of, of fracturing in the Karua. And of course, and this is the case then here at UCT, is that, that we all experience this university very differently. And I, and I would venture to say that as an alum, and as clearly as an active alum, because here you are on a Saturday afternoon, your experience may have been very different to the alumni that are not here. And of course, I cannot be the DVC for transformation and not observe the profile of the audience and not comment on the fact that some of those alumni that exist that we would have wanted to see here are not here. Where are our black alumni, right? Why aren't they here on a Saturday afternoon? Is it because of their particular experience of UCT that is being replicated, right? The way it's being replicated by me or about my own alma mater years, many, many years after. So the challenge for us then as, as UCT is that, you know, if, if it's possible that UCT is a place for some alumni and it's a place for some of our students, what is it then for others? And I come back to my definition of space versus place. And I want to suggest that for many students and staff and alumni, UCT is simply a space and not a place. That they reside in the spaces of what is UCT. <coughs> students often speak of the feeling of being erased, of, of feeling that they don't really matter. And when there's nothing, you don't matter. And so you perpetually reside in the spaces. And I'm very concerned when our students reside in the spaces and they don't see this as their place. So it may be a place for some, as I said, and a space for others. And I want to use the other, the word other here very intentionally because I want us to be cognizant of the fact that we perceive people that are different to ourselves as others. People that are disabled are other. People that are queer are other. People that are black are other. Men are other. I have to check myself. I sometimes make the comment to my husband and I say, you know, I've, I've, because I have a son and I, and I sometimes make the comment very carelessly and I say, oh, you know, I feel like I've given birth to an alien. <laughs> because he just feels so different to, to me and, and, and I've become very conscious and I don't do that anymore. Um, because what I realize what I'm doing is it, in that moment it feels very sort of, you know, I'm making a joke, but I'm othering him. And, and, and what happens in his mind when he hears me talking about him like that? Hopefully he will never watch this video. Um, so, so, of course, like I said, we, we're reminded that, that, that this university has to create that sense of place in each and every one of us. So when we talk about transformation at UCT, um, of course it's a, very, it's a very broad plate of, of things that we need to address. And, and so, um, but at the heart of it is, is to change the institutional culture. And that really also speaks to, to um, place. But, but we know that you know, we, we need to look at student and staff profile, of course, but actually we need to look at their experience um, we look at the, the culture in classrooms, the way in which we interact with each other at UCT. Um, it's about what we teach, it's about how we teach. The list is quite endless, believe me, it keeps, it keeps us all quite busy. But, but I just want to emphasize the, the extent to which physical space determines our sense of place. So we know that the roads must fall movement here at UCT focused on the role of names and statutes. And so here at UCT, as well as at other universities, Oxford in England, they had their own um, student protest around names. Similarly, Yale. And, and I'm emphasizing these universities because like UCT, these universities are deeply rooted 
in a colonial tradition and that, that we continue to physically and aesthetically embrace. And we uphold the names, the symbols, and the imagery that speaks to a time and an era that is no more. And what the protests have done is that the students have said to us, what is this all about? Why are you continue to honor as if we as humanity have not evolved? And I, and I think it was a very important question because universities are, of course, places of critical thinking. So to uncritically honor those, and when I say uncritically, in other words, we didn't contextualize any of these names. We simply left it there. We didn't, we didn't have any kind of conversation around these names. So we, we do it very uncritically that, you know, those that in this time and era no longer seem honorable, right? And so what I'm getting to is, of course, the fact that values change over time. Like two, two centuries ago, um, societal values were infinitely more tolerant about slavery. And then that changed. A century later, we have abolished slavery, but segregation, patriarchy, were very much acceptable societal norms. So it's not unsurprising that across the world, students are starting to challenge us as we continue to honor the names that are now associated with deeply questionable norms and legacy. The very same people that developed, contributed, or upheld regimes and political systems that kept people in perpetual states of other, otherness, um, we continue to honor. So not only do we have symbols and names that remind us of our painful past and for some present, but we're also devoid of recognizing those people or peoples that have made a different contributions to our history or that personify who we are when we are now in a much more diverse and inclusive space. So the call for the removal of the Rhodes statue presented a moment in time when we as a university had to reflect on that. The call for the removal of Rhodes was on the one hand a deeper call for decolonization, but it was also at the same time a much more uncomplicated question to reflect on who do we honor and why do we continue to honor them when our university has become a different place to when it was at the time that Rhodes donated land to establish a university. And so this puts us in a, on a, in a place or in a, on a path where we now revisit what UCT looked like as a physical place. So most recently, you know that we renamed Jameson Memorial Hall to Sarah Bartman Hall. This was announced um, on the December, the 13 December last year at the re-robing ceremony, or the robing ceremony of the, of the new vice chancellor. Now, this decision to remove the name Jameson was actually taken much earlier, I think at around 2016, but since then it has been Memorial Hall. And what the university then did was it went through quite a, a, a long consultative process, first asking for a list of names from the UCT community, some of you may have contributed to that process, and the naming of Buildings Committee, which is the com committee tasked by council to, to look at naming and renaming of, of buildings, and considered quite a long list of, of very diverse names. It decided on, on this name, Sarah Bartman, and that then triggered a process we had to go back to the community, you know, UCT, if nothing is, doesn't, you know, we, we're thorough. We then went back to the university community and we said, we've chosen Sarah Bartman, what do you think? Right? And so then, as a committee, we had to sift through, you know, hundreds and hundreds of comments from people um, sharing with us their, their sentiments around the name Sarah Bartman. Some of it, some of it very um, positive, some of them not. Um, but we also realized that, that if, we, if we decide, and we made the decision that, that we want to go with the name Sarah Bartman, but that we have to realize that, that this is somebody that is, a, it's a coy woman that has a community that identifies with her. And so we then also had a long consultative process. It took us about a year to consult with the coy leadership structure and, the, and, and, and community groups. Um, and that was quite a unique process. It was the first time that, that UCT went through that, that process. But um, 
it was quite important that, that we go through this process because UCT, of course, sits at the foot of this mountain, as I said earlier, that, that has deep significance for the Khoi, but UCT also is part of, part of a community here in Cape Town. It looks out over the Cape Flats, uh, a community that, that is very much connected to Sarah Bartman. So, of course, Bartman, as, as you may or may not know, was, taken, was born in the Eastern Cape, and at the age of 20, she was taken to London by a British ship surgeon called William Dunlop, and there he, in, 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 back in London, he paraded her as a sexual freak. In um, 1814, he moved her to France, and there he sold her to animal trainer, where she was exhibited in France once again, big focus on her coloring, on her large buttocks. Um, she was hyper-sexualized um, as a woman. And she died a year later, um, but after her death, she was dissected, a plaster cast was made of a body, and she was displayed in a museum from 1816 until 1986. Her remains were returned to South Africa in 2006 after a series of governmental interventions, and she, was, she is currently buried in the Hamtuas Valley near Hanke in the Eastern Cape, where she was born. Now, the proposal to name um, so the Memorial Hall after Sarah Bartman quoted Pumna Kola, who argues that the hyper-visible corporeality of Sarah Bartman is, is symbolic of the colonial tropes of how African people entered into the public consciousness through their bodies, not as rational beings, but through their bodies. Salim Badat makes the following observation. He says, Colonial ontology was predicated on the belief that unlike Europeans who were Christians, civilized and modern, Africans were pagan, primitive, and without civilization, had no history, were not part of humanity, and were incapable of rationality. So Africans were characterized in that permanent deficit. So then it was perfectly acceptable to treat her body in that, in that manner. So, Sarah Bartman was the subject of knowledge and exhibited in the name of science. So, renaming a building that stands on the original land of the Khoi, a building that carries the patronage and the cultural capital of colonialism, to now carry the name of a woman who was no statesman, no political leader. Of course, we had many names. I mean, Mandela was high on the name of, of, of suggestions. She was no statesman. She's no political leader. She wasn't a scientist. She wasn't a scholar. She wasn't even a community leader. She was simply an ordinary Khoi woman who became the subject of sexual and scientific fascination. And so, so to, to rename this building to this ordinary, after this ordinary woman, I think is, is quite important because I think it recognizes the multifaceted struggles and the resilience of a woman such as, as Sarah Bartman. But I think in honoring her through naming a building that stands at the heart of knowledge production, we begin to reimagine the different ways in which knowledge is produced and the different ways in which knowledge contributes to society. We're beginning to say knowledge is not just produced here on the hill. Knowledge is produced on the flats. It's a different body of knowledge, but it's a body of knowledge that we value. And we know that as scientists. We go out there and we, we have interviews with those people as subjects, right? We don't recognize them as contributors of knowledge. And that shift is beginning to happen, but I think part of renaming a building that is so momentous to somebody that we have always seen as only a subject, becomes an important moment for us. But it also means that UCT begins to carry a different meaning, not just for students and staff. Because I must say, it was interesting. I, was, I already left on, on leave when the, when the announcement came. But as I stepped off the plane, it's the sort of between the, when the announcement came, you know, and I still saw the email, and then we, we then um, departed. When I stepped off the plane on, on the other side, 
Um, I had like 50 emails in my inbox that commented on the rename. Lots of them very, very positive. Lots of them very negative. So, so this, was, this is something that, that people feel quite strongly about and people question it. Some people applaud it. But lots of people say to me, you know how momentous it was to actually graduate on the 13th of December in the hall that is now that now carries the name of, of this woman. So I think in that moment, I think we created an alum that has a sense of place, that has a sense of belonging. I also think that the way in which we engaged with the broader community around the renaming has created a very important link to UCT. I think we're beginning the process where UCT is not seen as they're sitting on the hill, but it's becoming part of the community. And I think that should be just as important to you as it is to me, that we create an alum that's not like me, but that we create a body of alumni that will feel as strongly and as passionately as you feel about this university. And we will only do that if they feel like they belong to UCT, if they have and they carry with them a sense of place about UCT. Thank you. Thank you very much. There is an opportunity now for anybody who would like to, to engage with Professor Ferris and to ask questions and to put points of view. Is there anybody who would like to do so? Yes. Hello. Yeah. Uh, it was a very interesting talk. Thank you very much. And um, no problem. Um, the word legacy is mentioned here. And I understand your point about um, ensuring that a broader community uh, feels uh, that the legacy is important here. I mean, I, I think that's uh, very, very true. Uh, and I think UCT has mostly managed to do uh, progress in, in a, in a correct way, shall I say, in that regard. Um, roads notwithstanding. Um, but I just wondered about this. I was at Fuller Hall. Um, I got there on merit. My daughter was at Fuller Hall. My granddaughter's coming to UCT uh, this year and would like to be in Fuller Hall. But as I understand from Anwar Mall, um, it's just totally random whether anybody gets in. Now, she, uh, she qualified, uh, in the sense she got eight distinctions and average of 93% and she's doing a science degree. So, you know, what else do you, do you want? But uh, there seems no provision where we're talking about funding, alumni, being committed, um, you know, to encourage where in deserving cases that there can, uh, that a tradition can carry on. Um, I just wondered if you feel this is a possible lacuna. Um, I mean, commitments, they're all right, but wouldn't it be good to strengthen it so that there's a real incentive to uh, commit to uh, the legacy project? It, it seems a pity to, to waste that sort of thing. Thank you. We'll, we'll try and take two or three questions at once. Is there another? Yes, there's a question in the middle at the back. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Landa Mabenge, um, class of 2006. I must say, Prof. Hugh, you look not a day older than when I graduated. <laughs> um, so my question is, like, thank you for the, the lecture. Um, and I like the fact that you, you commented on how there are so few black people here. Where are the black alumni? And as part of the legacy, I wanted to just find out, is there a way or are there 
any possibilities in trying to rally and have alumni, especially, especially those that come from previously disadvantaged and currently disadvantaged spaces, to be able to contribute to the culture, especially the transformation of the space, without necessarily having to cough out of the coffers, if that makes sense. So is there any way to rally the troops and, and, and create a space where alumni, who are not coming from wealthy backgrounds, are still able to contribute and be impactful in terms of their legacy at UCT. Loretta, could you try those two? Yeah, thank you. So let me start um, by tackling the, the question around Kula Hall. I think what has happened is that the, the demographics of, of students have changed quite a lot um, over the last, especially over the last five years after we've made a very concerted effort to say, you know what, we, of course, we, we, we will have students that comes from a black students, from, from, your, from your private schools, from your so-called, well, previously Model C schools. But, but we're really interested in having the young, bright minds that comes from a Kailicha, that comes from Limpopo. And we want to be a university where, where they can come. Now, what are the consequences of that? And, and one of the portfolios that, that reports to me is student affairs. And so I'm, I'm quite aware of, of how we begin to shape residences. Residences um, are very important to actually be an extension for those students who come with a schooling background where they would not have had the kind of support that you would have at a school that is not a quintal one, two, or three school. And so we, we almost um, give, we're at a point where we want to give preferential access to those students who just need that kind of supporting environment. And so as a result, we kind of had to, to make difficult decisions around, um, you know, do we continue to give preferential access to, to people that have a longer tradition? And so those are priorities that are very hard to weigh up, you know, um, and it becomes it becomes a tension. But but I will, you know, I, I cannot but be apologetic for the fact that I want residences to be a space because what we do is we were able to run extra tutorials in in residences. Um, so so we're creating that kind of structure where the academics can continue um, and. You know, we've never run the, 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 the data, but at some point I want us to see, you know, how students fare in a race versus those that are side of, but, but, I, but I am pretty sure what we will see is that students in, that are in, the res, in our resident system does academically better, especially, you know, if you look at where they come from. So, so obviously you have to compare apples with apples. Um, because we, we try to give that. And so I guess it's part of my, my comment earlier about how context, how the, you know, as a changing context um, means that we need to think a little bit different about a university and, and how we create that inclusivity. Um, but, but of course it's very important that your daughter feels, your granddaughter feels that she belongs to UCT as well. And, and I hope that, that there's different ways in it, and it doesn't only come from being at, at Kula Hall, because it is very important that she, she has that, that sense of belonging, and that, you know, she, she, yeah, that she'll be able to see herself in future years as a, as a UCT alum. On the issue of, of um, rallying black alumni, um, I absolutely agree with you, and so that's why I made the point about um, when, I, when I made the point about me not being a good alumni, I, I said I, I, I don't contribute either my time or money. Because I think that's what we can contribute, is, is ways that we can contribute our time. So, so I think, for example, you know, the, the students that come, I had a student in my office yesterday, um, and and the story he told me, you know, as a story just, just afterwards I kind of had to have a moment because I just had to pull myself to my, towards myself because it just speaks of the very difficult um, conditions that students are in. That student happened to have 
somebody that he kind of sees as a mentor. And that person was with him in my office. And I could, you know, and he even talked about how there was a moment where he felt like he was just going to give up. But the fact that he was able to reach out to this person um, made a difference. So, so, you know, those are the ways that I think black alumni can, can help us and support us by, by giving your time, and, and, and some do. So for example, last year in particular, we, we placed a lot of emphasis on advocacy around mental wellness because the year before was an absolutely disastrous year in terms of, of suicide rates. Um, and so we called on our alumni and they came to talks and they came to workshops and I'm talking about our black alumni. Um, and that's just one example, you know, so it's not just about the money, it's about the time that, that, that you do. And I'm certainly, I mean, Diana sits here as well, um, and, and um, there, are, there are other people that um, can, you know, um, speak to, to what, how we can connect alumni and, and the executive. Um, by the way, right now we, 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 we're starting a big food security initiative. Uh, if you have connections, for example, to people that can donate food to us, you know, um, that's many, one of the many ways in which you can contribute. Uh, thank you. I, could I just add two points to that? Um, there's a very active group of black alumni who are per capita better financial contributors to UCT than white alumni. <laughs> uh, I just have to make that point because it is the case. <laughs> the second one, um, uh, the Alumni Association AGM is on the 20th of February and uh, that's a good time for black alumni to come and Diana is the chair of the uh, Alumni Association. So that's just you know, two, two comments in respect of that. Any other comments, any other questions? Right at the back please and right at the front. Should we do this one first? Good evening, Prof. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, and uh, this is the first opportunity to tell you, well, congratulations on the achievement of the renaming um, to Sarah Bartman Hall. Um, I think you, I'm sure you had a big part to play in that. Um, my question is regarding some of the um, concerns or critiques around that renaming. Um, and one of the foremost that um, um, I've been in conversation with is that perhaps, well, it's important to recognize it as an achievement, absolutely, um, but a qualified achievement, um, that perhaps it's um, not only simply an accomplishment, but a challenge to the university. Um, you were telling me, you were telling us all about um, the, um, the farm worker on the outskirts of Beaufort West, um, He's called a colored, um, and as his his or her um, boy identity has been erased, um, living in poverty as well. Um, what does that name mean to him? Um, so, where I'm going with that is, how does um, um, those um, communities who continue to experience um, um, the legacy of, of colonialism um, today in the city and, and, and across the country? Um, is it, a, is, is it a, a challenge that is still um, unrealized um, um, in terms of our, in our institutional um, space and knowledge production? Okay. 
Thank you for, the, for those two questions. So, oh yes, of course, I mean, I, I cannot agree with you more that uh, the bigger challenge lies in, in that, that that is more intangible, right? It's people's attitude um, and the way that people interact with each other. Um, we'd be doing a big project now around unconscious bias because especially at a university such as UCT, we, we tend to believe that we are all you know, progressive thinkers, that we don't hold any bias towards anybody, but actually when we begin to dig in our own unconscious minds, that, that bias becomes very clear. And I think you're correct that it may play a role in, in not the policy. The policy is the policy. You know, as a lawyer, I, I fundamentally believe in rules um, and the value of rules. But the rules are applied in a very specific manner. And rules can be applied to exclude or rules can be applied to, to include. And so um, we, for, from, from my perspective, it's, it's very important to always be open uh, to that, to the extent to which rules um, can actually exclude. And over the last two years, we've, we've done a lot of work to look at things, you know, such as financial exclusion, academic exclusion, um, and there's been quite a number of significant changes in policy. But, but in the end, you know, it's, it's fundamentally also about how we interact with students. And, and sometimes you can actually tell a student and give a student <coughs> news that is not good news, but it's also, you know, about, you know, how, how, how what, what is the kind of humanity in which, in which you <coughs> manner in which you, you interact with people. So, and that's not, you know, it's a South African problem. It's a universal <coughs> problem. It's a problem that we need to continue to consciously um, address. And that's the only undertaking that, that I can give you. Um, so, Dick, I mean, I, I absolutely agree with you. Um, it's a challenge. Um, part of how we've, we've, we've begun to address it, certainly um, in the renaming process, is partnering with um, the Koi community. Um, and I think co-creating um, a space that will go beyond the renaming um, and so it wasn't, it's not a consultation process that has actually ended. We've committed to continue to meet with a the, with the group of people and we're thinking about, for example, engaged research um, that, that needs to happen, that should have happened. Um, and, and it's, you know, for example, also uh, some of you may have read that we, about two years ago, we, we discovered some human remains at the Faculty of Health Science that were unethically obtained. And we are now in a process of repatriating um, or reburying those remains in, from Sutherland. And those are Koi remains as well. And there again, with that community, we engaged around, you know, how do we do this? Um, and, and how do we do this in partnership with the descendants of, of those people? Um, and I mean, one of the things very interesting, somebody said, you know what, um, midwives, we've, th th there's one midwife left in this area, um, and when she dies, the knowledge, the very particular knowledge around midwivery, is that a word, um, will die. Um, and it struck a chord in me. I mean, I was, I was born in the Northern Cape um, by a midwife, and I know that that's a very, it's not just a, you know, it's not just a process, it's a very sort of this traditional knowledge that is embedded in that process, also in the care of the mother and the antenatal care of the baby. And so, so, it, so there's, a, there's a cultural link towards midwivery. Um, and so we've already started, you know, the beginnings of a, of a research project around that. So and I think that's the way in which we can begin to, to, to br bring back, in a way, people's lost um, ancestry and history. And, and of course, this is just one example. We need to begin to be a, a university that's much more of an anchor um, in community. Um, it, of course, it does a lot of engaged research, but, but I think there's ways in which we can begin to reshape and rethink. Oh, we could clearly go on to the rest of the night on this one, but can I take two more if there are two more? Thank you, and, Professor. And, and, and after them, the two at the, two in the, the back, left. I'm not sure. Can you hear me? Thank you, Professor. I really enjoyed being here this evening. It's the first time. My name is Monique. 
I graduated um, um, in 2005 um, and also in 2009 from UCT. I put myself through UCT in my 30s after going through a traumatic divorce in England after working in a corporate environment. And while all my friends were married with children, I was a full-time student. UCT provided a place for me, a place of incredible um, safety, a place where I'm so proud to have graduated from. I work in education, I'm a teacher because of UCT. I'm still single, I'm still without children, and I'm constantly othered as a woman. Because I don't fit into those molds. Everyone is, why don't you have children? Why don't you have a husband? Well, UCT gave me the confidence to say I didn't need that. I have my education because of this place, and I am forever indebted to it. And coming to these lectures was the biggest privilege of my life. So it's a great privilege for me to be here this evening, and thank you so much. for delivering such a powerful speech and all the work that you've done at UCT. However, as a UCT alumni of the class of 2018, I'm yet to see transformative work geared at African international students, particularly those dwelling in the SADAC region. It is no secret that there are a lot of socioeconomic as well as political factors that are affecting the region we are residing in that is pushing students to be attracted to come study at UCT rather than their own home countries, an example being Zimbabwe. What is UCT doing under the transformation portfolio to try and accommodate the needs of those who leave their countries in search of better lives in South Africa? There is definitely life outside UCT. And so how is UCT accommodating those that are in desperate need of opportunity to alleviate the stressful intersection in which they reside and called far enough. Thank you very much. Thank you, and then one last one. <laughs> yeah. But those kids may one never know 
that there's a place called Sarabhatma uh, at the bottom of the mountain and they'll never uh, even finish matric or even get a chance to get a scholarship or come through this system. So are we not trying to be very political by these renamings and yet the reality is the schools in our township, the education is very poor. I tutor my maid's uh, daughter, she is 26, and the teacher gets the answers wrong. So you get the teacher who's the blind leading the blind. So should UCT not actually not look at transforming from the ground up, not from the top? Because in Zim, it's fully transformed. We have a shortage of universities. We've got lots of black lecturers, lecturers of different races, but that's not that won't solve the problem. It, it, what, what UCT is, it's a, it's a place of education, and that's what we need to mainly focus on, which is educating South Africans. And um, you're right on mentoring. I sacrifice my time, I'm not a perfect man, but I sacrifice my time to teach this girl, because I notice there's no future for her. She's just going to end up in that system again of not finishing school and never seeing a, um, having a chance to be at a university. So, okay, thank you. Um. I am going to close questions now because otherwise we'll go on until kingdom come. Um, but uh, Loretta, please, if you could try to address those questions. One of the things I th I'm sure you will talk about is the project that UCT, the 100 Up on the Schools project, in the townships in Cape Town, which is delivering results. I mean, for the last four years, we've had people coming from those schools to UCT, and last year we saw the first of them graduate. Um, so that's, you know, that's one concrete step, but I'll leave answers to Loretta better placed to answer than I am. Um, thank you, you, because I think there were about five questions or maybe six wrapped up in, in, in your statement. Um, but that's, that's one of the answers, so, so maybe let me start there, um, is of course that, so, so look, you know, basic education is a tremendous challenge, right, and we see it, and, and I think, and it's not just for UCT, I think all universities um, sit with students who, who have to uh, deal with an attainment gap. And by the way, it's a worldwide problem. It is a worldwide problem. Uh, for the last two years, I've been traveling to different countries and we talk about, one of the things that we talk about is this deficit. Um, I spoke to colleagues at Oxford. They, one of the initiatives that they, they're trying to get more students because Oxford in particular has been drawing students that are um, upper middle class. So they, they're trying to change their profile and the attainment gap is a huge one. So, so this is one that all universities struggle with. South Africa has a challenge that it has and hasn't had, but a unique challenge is what I'm trying to say. Um, and, and we can do what we can. And, and one of the ways in which we do this is to uh, work with five schools um, in Kailicha and, and in um, Mitchell's Plain in particular, and we work with students from grade 10 right through to grade 12, and then we have an additional program where we um, work with a, with a cohort of, of grade 12 students only um, to prepare them for university, not just for UCT, but, but for university. Um, and a significant number, as you said, come to us, and, and that's our contribution. But, but the question about othering, you know, this is not about excluding. So what, what we are driving in our strategic plan, and that's certainly part of what I'm doing through, through my portfolio, is to create an inclusive university. Inclusivity doesn't mean you exclude anybody. It's about how do we hold all of this. It's a, it's a tremendous challenge. But this is, this is simply, we, this is about saying we actually are not pursuing a diverse space. We are just pursuing a inclusive space, which means that we want to see the, the, the broader scope of not just South Africans, but actually we're an African university and we want to see um, that, that, that UCT is, is an African university. Why the fuss around roads? It was the time when people woke up and said around the world, you know, why are we holding on to the symbols of colonialism? Certain things just happened at a particular time. 
why did they, you know, and, and, and there may be reasons, and, and, and one can have a very much longer conversation around why do things happen at a particular time? Why did the, you know, the Arab Spring happen when it happened? You know, there, there are certain moments in history when, when you get to a moment where you begin to question that, what, that which was not questioned before. And it was a time and moment when we begin to question, you know, the vestiges of, of colonialism. African students um, that, uh, in particular, Sadiq students, I think that, that one of the, the ways in which we um, certainly look at this is we're working very closely also, by the way, with the, with the SRC, um, is to ensure that we, we address or we, we see ourselves first and foremost as an African university. Um, and that to the extent that we are hampered structurally, um, that we can find other ways of, of including um, African students, or students, non-South non African African students. And, and what I'm trying to say is when it comes to, for example, issues, the issues that are much easier to address around funding becomes much more complicated when it comes to students from SADC and other parts of the country because of the constraints that we face. So. Um, so, for example, one of the agreements that we had with the SRC since 2017 almost is that, you know, from a university point of view, we can, um, we can make provision within our financial aid for South African students. When students, when, when the non-South African students come to us, we, we can direct you to the SRC because their money has less constraints. You know, we can only spend government money on South Africans. So, so you know, we always try and find where are the low-hanging fruit when it comes to, to our students. Um, right now, we, we're dealing very specifically with a crisis that, that some students are experiencing. I spoke to IAPO yesterday. Um, and they said to me, so one of the ways that we're trying to deal with this crisis is by saying, for example, to students from Zim, as long as you can indicate, because one of the problems that they have is they can't get money out. So as long as we can see that you have, um, have a, a, an application at the bank for a foreign transfer and you have a bank stamp, even though the money is not in our account, you know, you'll, you can come and register. So it's about how do we see, I mean, it's like you say, the policies is policies, but how do we how do we create some flexibility in the system to make sure that students can come to UCT? And then, you know, from an inclusivity point of view, that's one of the things that, the, that we look at when we do peer education, is, is it's a very specific focus um, in our training and awareness around inclusivity, is that it is about the intersectionality of, you know, of background, of race, of nationality, sexuality, etc. And then finally, Monique, I can only applaud you and, and honor you for, for um, your view and for, for being very intentionally, you know, outside of the mold. Um, I think we need more people to, to be willing to say, I live outside the mold and to challenge the mold. And, and I, you know, I wish that my child is, is, is being taught by somebody who's willing to to challenge the conventional, because I think the kids in your class will be richer because of it. Um, and I'm very grateful that you say that UCT contributed to that. So thank you for, for sharing your thoughts with us. It, it simply remains for me to thank you all for coming and to thank Loretta in particular for what clearly has been a stimulating and thought-provoking lecture. I think what it also shows is how complex running a place like UCT is today and how UCT is tackling, not always correctly, but with purpose and with vigour, the challenge that it faces. So may I thank you, Loretta, very much indeed for this address and thank everybody here Oh. <laughs> there is a... I, I always feel very uncomfortable when UCT gives UCT exactly. <laughs> <laughs> you have to fear the Greeks when bringing gifts. <laughs> so, Loretta, this is just to thank you for 
giving us time on a Saturday. We, we, you know, when, I, when we spoke to you to ask you to do this, it was never that we wanted you to work on a Saturday. So we thought it was a small gesture and, uh, of our appreciation for that inspiring talk. You've inspired us to think more deeply on these issues, I think, um, issues of space, belonging, identity, and how these relate to the student experience. And I think we'll all walk away with a sort of deeper sense of how these things impact students. Um, can we give you this very small gift on behalf of the Development Alumni Department? Thank you very much. Thank you very Lieber. much. Thank you. Thank you. I just wanted to add the symbolism of the gift, uh, Prof. Harris, is that that particular beverage is produced by two pioneering black women entrepreneurs who are actually um, disrupting the space of wine, the wine industry in South Africa. And one of them is a UCLM. I just thought you should. Yeah. Ah. <laughs>